Begin with the term archive rats. You may remember this. This was a, uh, a comment that uh, a certain Joseph Stalin made in response to party historians that were calling into question some of his more dubious assertions in <laughs> the, the history of the Bolshevik Party uh, short course. Um, and, you know, I'm a self-declared, I have been self-declared uh, archive rat over the past year or so, traveling around looking at the uh, Clara Tekin documents in, in Amsterdam and particularly in Berlin, I'll talk about those later on, uh, to kind of get to the bottom of Tekin's legacy, what she wrote, what she stood for, etc., uh, which is, has its own complicated history, which we'll get into. Uh, the one of the outputs of this journey as a part of my postdoc, uh, uh, Leverhulme postdoc, is this little pamphlet here, which came out. So we were going to time it with her birthday in July, uh, slightly held up, and for uh, unforeseen circumstances, I don't have any copies on me, but it is available to buy now. Uh, this is a proof copy, obviously. Um, so just at this point, thanks to Tina uh, for putting it together. Thanks to Tom for the cover. Uh, Tom G, and also for the uh, amazing support I get online from my Patreon supporters. This started off basically as a kind of weekly installment of uh, Tekken translations, um, and has gradually over the uh, course of the past year become uh, uh, what I hope is a nice little pamphlet. It's, I'll go into the content in a second, but essentially this uh, translation, this, this text is uh, Tekken's uh, first ever published uh, pamphlet in 1889 when she was kind of forging her way, uh, creating her path in the international workers' movement, coinciding with the speech that she gave for the liberation of women at the founding congress of the Marxist, of the, the founding Marxist congress of the Second International in Paris in 1889. Uh, broadly breaks down into uh, three uh, three chapters I'll discuss in a second is my introduction. Some of that was in a, a weekly worker article recently that hopefully you've seen and we can discuss uh, the translation of the text itself and probably one of the more extensive biographical timelines of her life, things she wrote, where she was, what she did, etc. I'm not gonna spend too much time on her a uh, uh, particular timeline and the things she did today, because I want to focus on the, the book and some of the uh, uh, the ideas it contains. But you, you, I assume that many of you will be aware of, of Tekin and her work. Um, and if you have any questions, obviously let me know. The three chapters it breaks down into, the first one is the economic transformation of women and women's lives, um, women and public life, and women and raising children. So in a sense, it is a pamphlet responding not only to developments of the time, the change in role of the family, the incorporation in, in, on mass of women into industry in particular, but also to debates within the workers' movement itself at the time and precisely how to respond uh, to these developments in terms of working class politics and working class organization. And if you indulge me, I'm going to read a few sections from the, each of the chapters before going on to discuss why I think it's important to rediscover Tetkin's work to, uh, to the extent that we have it available to us and not just locked away in archives, as I will discuss, um, and potentially what we can draw on uh, from, from her life and legacy and how indeed the, the kind of three or four main sources that I identify uh, as having been responsible for either the uh, the eradication of that legacy or its complete distortion or its complete distortion to the point where it's completely eradicated. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but what does she have to say about the economic transformation of women? Uh, there's a nice um, uh, quote here in, in, the, in the first chapter. She says, the development of the means of production thus destroyed the economic basis of the women's activity within the family, but at the same time created the conditions for her activity in society, outside of the home and on the market of life. Once running a household was no longer as taxing as it once was, bourgeois women gradually devoted their free time exclusively to entertainment and pleasure. In exceptional cases, they also occupied themselves with serious intellectual pursuits, 
acquiring a proper education, or engaging in the sport of charity. Generally speaking, ever since the upheaval in economic re relations represented by capitalism and industrialization, bourgeois women have played the role of a luxury article or a pleasure animal in social life. The collapse of the former conditions of existence for the women and girls of the middle classes required them to earn money. If at all possible, they turned to the so-called liberal professions, teaching, nursing, etc., and to industries associated with the arts. The movement for women's education was not produced by a thirst for knowledge or a sudden realization of the intellectual equality of the female sex, but in essence, it was brought about by the transformation in economic relations. The question of how to earn one's bread had to be answered just in case a breadwinner could not be found in the form of man. The movement for women's education developed step by step and in parallel with the decline of the middle classes. For the mass of women, for those without property, the very same economic conditions that destroyed their former sphere of activity within the household led to a new field of work in industry. Women's work finally moved from the home to society. So on the one hand, She's describing the upheaval that that represented, the utter, utterly dire circumstances in which women have worked and were exploited. But at the same time, says that we, shall, we should not dwell on the past or look to turn back the, uh, the, the clock of history, as it were, because this is a new, uh, a new development and we, it's, it, it would be a waste of time to oppose it. Some in the German workers of the uh, movement at the time, particularly in the, the ADA, the, the, the Sally Nipples organization, uh, seeing the, the reality of women's and, ch and children's work as well, arrived at a kind of sectional conclusion that women should they, that women's work should be banned. Right? So it's either informed by the idea that women uh, uh, produce wages because of great greater competition on the on the on the labor market, and or the the experience of seeing what that, what this uh, new form of work represented uh, for for the. For, the majority of, of, of women at the time. And Setkin takes up these arguments. Um, she looks at the question of uh, how, yes, indeed, uh, women and children and child labor obviously increases the, uh, the supply of labor on the market, which brings down wages, etc. But the point is to organize this women. And in particular, in the 1880s, 1890s, part of the, uh, uh, the one of the many uh, aspects of work of the, of the German Social Democrats was a focus on uh, trade union organization among, uh, among women. And there's, there's, a, there's a whole lot of detail she goes into about that process and, uh, and why it's absolutely necessary that men and women combine uh, it, it, their forces against the, uh, against the power of capital and men, women and men's interests are not uh, set aside each other. On uh, women and, and public life, there's a, there's a long quote I'd rather, rather read here. Um, so she said that these economic developments, how do they refine, find reflection within society? She writes, how then can it be argued that the woman approached public life with her eyes closed, her ears covered, and her arms folded? How can it be argued that she should not ask for a pound of rights when she must provide a hundredweight in duties? Is the female worker in industry who creates the wealth of the nation with her blood and sweat while manufacturing her own begging stick? not even to have the miserable right to consult with others about her interests in assemblies or to elect those representatives to legislative and executive, executive bodies, which she is convinced have the actual welfare of the people in mind. Just as women and their productive activity have been thrown out of the family, so too must their thinking and feeling be torn from the narrowly defined sphere of the domestic environment. It must be transferred from the family to humanity. Women must no longer hide behind the domestic heart. They must live within society. One-sided, hide-bound, and deeply egotistic love for the family must be replaced with a general feeling of solidarity that women so clearly lack at the present. The economic significance of women as a force of production must finally find reflection in social political rights. Finally, she then turns to the question of the, the upheaval in family relations and how that finds reflection in raising children, uh, educate, educating children, and as, uh, roles that were traditionally assigned to, uh, uh, to, to the mother, and um, make some rather sharp uh, comments about that. She writes, for example, bourgeois, bourgeois morality is the desert sand in which the ostrich buries its head when something unpleasant approaches. It must also serve as the last resort when it comes to defending keeping women tied 
to the household. Um, so she's got some choice uh, uh, mar remarks about that. And what I want to do now is to, so having kind of set out the, the main arguments of the book, is to take a step back and, you know, as I, as I did in the, in the Weekly Worker article, kind of ask ourselves why it's taken so long for Setkin, who was a hugely respected international leader of the workers' movement, who was involved in the, that movement from the 1880s through to her death in the 1930s. Uh, I make the claim that in terms of her reach and her popularity, she was certainly on, on a par with some of the leaders that you know, Le Lenin, Luxembourg, etc., um, and was seen as such uh, in terms of her role in the Comintern, that she would often go to important congresses in Italy, in France, for example, um, to intervene and uh, throw her weight behind the, the, the forces of the left when, when uh, joining the Comintern. Etc. Um, and, and how it's come to pass, it's taken so long for her the first ever pamphlet she wrote, which kind of serves as a guideline, I would argue, for her overall political approach here, how it's taken so long for that to be translated. And as I say, there are a few um, uh, schools of thought that, that I identify in, in my research as, as leading to, to, this, uh, to this problem. Um, I would argue that probably the, the most important aspect of her legacy, she a career so spanned four or five decades. She was all involved in all sorts of activity as a parliamentarian, as a writer, as an editor, as an organizer, as an agitator, um, and, and so on and so forth. But I would argue that probably her greatest contribution in terms of the politics of Marxism is precisely the what became known as the International Socialist Workers, particularly the German wing of that. So she was the um, one of the, the, the leading theoreticians behind the development of a particular strategy towards women's liberation, which is kind of helpfully summarized under the term, which you may have heard of, the clean break. And the clean break, the Rheinische Scheidung in German, is something that uh, <laughs> appears throughout her, her, her writings on, on, on the, the women's question in, in Germany and beyond, uh, to the point where I think she, she wrote that there was a, a, the clean break, once again on the clean break, once again on the clean break, within the space of about three weeks, in response to critics, not only from uh, the bourgeois uh, women's movement, uh, which I'll discuss in, in a second, but also within the ranks of her own party, particularly uh, uh, a woman by the name of Lily Brown, who was associated with the revisionist right, and cr uh, criticism of, of Tekken for her uh, supposed dogmatism on this, on this, on this question. So what was the clean break and how did it refine reflection in Tekin's writings and in her career? The cr clean break is essentially informed by the idea that within capitalist society, there are as many women's movements as there are social classes. So in response to the economic transformation that I briefly, uh, uh, probably too briefly sketched out uh, uh, just now, the women's question is posed for the first time because women, at least in theory, have the economic independence to live their own lives separately or independently from men and from the family, right? That's the question that's posed, albeit in different ways, as Setkin says, because some women clearly have it better than others. So she talks about the, the, the bourgeois women enjoying a life of luxury and support of charity and intellectual pursuits, etc. So for Setkin, the way to respond to this question is to organize women, not just on the trade union level, as I, as I outlined briefly before, but by incorporating them into social democracy. Social democracy, uh, the, 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 work, the Workers' Party in Germany, must take a lead in organizing women, and it, not just in, in terms of organizing women, but a, a clear political lead with a distinct a clean uh, a, a, and, and distinct approach to this question in a strategic sense. What she, she fleshes it out by saying, we do not deny for a second the significance of the bourgeois women's movement in terms of some of the reforms it advocates and the ideas that it puts forward. Right? What we question, however, 
is their ability to achieve anything beyond tinkering uh, uh, reforms without addressing the fundamental cause, the fundamental economic cause of, uh, of the oppression of women and the, and the alienation of, of, of human beings more, more generally. That, she says, calls for uh, a, a women's movement that has its own distinct message of uh, uh, organizing against the power of capital to overcome uh, capitalist relations. And in, in early on in her career, in, in the, I think it's 1894, Engels is still alive. There is a, um, in terms of women's suffrage, there is a group of uh, bourgeois women's writers that put forward a petition, kind of begging petition to the Kaiser to say, you know, please give us the, please give us the vote. Uh, we're responsible citizens. We, we want to, uh, to, to the vote just as much as anyone, anyone else. And some in the party, uh, uh, it, around the leadership of Forbes, the uh, leading uh, daily uh, paper of, of German social democracy, are kind of soft on this and say, well, yeah, maybe we should get involved with this. This seems like something we should do. And Setkin in Die Gleichheit, this is where she talks of Die Rheinische uh, Rheinisch Scheidung, the clean break, says we must absolutely not have anything to do with this kind of women's movement. We need a clear approach, which is for universal suffrage uh, a, a, a universal equal and direct suffrage for everyone, obviously, uh, men and women, and not just try to uh, beg for tinkering reforms of maybe some women get the votes, the, what she called it, the, the lady suffrage, the Dahmen Weilbecht, yeah, within the, the, the framework of this horrendous anti-democratic Kaiserreich constitution, right, going begging for the Kaiser. And it causes a bit of a stink, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about uh, later on about how Tekin's whole career essentially uh, revolves around, you know, the, the, the party's not always right, it's actually really wrong, <laughs> we'll talk about that later on, uh, it causes a huge stink, and recently in, in my uh, archival rattery, uh, I found an unpublished uh, letter from uh, Setkin to Engels, correspondence, and, uh, uh, and, and Setkin says, Engels, can I just pick your brain here, do you think I've got this right on this question? And um, because I've, I've annoyed Babel, I've annoyed the leaders of Forbes, and he says, uh, Babel, uh, Engels writes back and says, uh, I think Clara here has absolutely shown the way forward. Bravo, Clara, is the, is the, the thing. And again, we'll, we'll translate that it's in German at the moment. But, uh, and again, this isn't a kind of appeal to authority. So, you know, if Engels said it, so it's right. Uh, but it's just an interesting episode in that, in that whole uh, debate about how to uh, respond to the question of suffering in this instance, right, and the exclusion of women uh, uh, from, from public life, and indeed the working class uh, more, more generally given the Prussian uh, treaty of suffrage and, uh, and all, all the, the rest of it. So that is the kind of the, the basic uh, idea, the basic understanding between uh, uh, the, 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 the idea of the clean break. There can be uh, joint activities. We, we, we could possibly, say, for example, attend the same demonstration, uh, as these as these women's rights, etc. But what is absolutely fundamental is that the Social Democratic Party has its own message, and moreover, that the Social Democratic Party cannot tolerate. And I, I had this quote in the Weekly Worker article: that it, that it should not tolerate the emergence of women's rightist views. I'll, I'll unpack that in a second. What that actually means, because there's a translation issue of women's rightist views that set the interests of men and women against each other. Right, it should actually organize the class as a whole, men and women, in the struggle for the rights of everyone. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of the, the the basic understanding of it. And I would argue that that was not only um, so she some some people call it the schoolmistress of uh, the socialist women's movement for an you know, absolute clear insistence on this question, a dogmatism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I would argue that while see, you know that may seem pedantic or it may seem like a small uh, point actually that created or helped create the theoretical basis for the, the German proletarian workers, uh, women's movement, the German uh, socialist women's movement, and, the, and, and on the basis of that as a kind of model to be copied beyond there, uh, the international socialist women's movement of which she was the, the chair, and indeed her uh, publication, Die Gleichheit, which is the, the, the subject of my, of my current research, was a uh, um, declared to be the, as they put it in the language of the time, the leading organ of that movement, right? So it was the, it was the, the, the leading the, uh, publication of that movement. It would carry reports from Russia, from wherever, in terms of uh, developments within the socialist women's movement and would take a lead in those, in those questions. It should also be said that when it came to the, the Gleichheit, 
following on from what I've just said about the clean break, it was not the case that this was a women's journal in the, in the traditional sense of the word for two reasons. It wasn't uh, a journal that just dealt with so-called women's issues, right? Uh, and also it was the case that, so, so for an example, uh, to, to illustrate that, Setkin, as, as is probably well known, would use Die Gleichheit as a way also of intervening within discussions in the party, not as a kind of uh, uh, um, instrumentalized way of going to say, oh, I've got this magazine so we can use. No, because of her insistence that all comrades in the party, male and female, were aware of developments in the party that understood what was going on in the party and indeed internationally. So one of the common, uh, I've got a little spreadsheet of themes that I've discovered in Die Gleichheit as I'm going through it, and a common recurring theme every September, every August to October broadly, more or less all the lead articles are on the coming or past SPD party congress, right? So that's, for example, uh, the, the, the kind of articles where you will find her stuff against Bernstein, against revisionism, against militarism, and, and, and all the rest of it. The second aspect in which it shouldn't be seen as a, as a kind of uh, a, a narrowly defined women's magazine is that Tekin was also insistent that men worked for it, worked on it, wrote for it, and distributed it. Uh, and that was in line with the party policies adapted, uh, slightly complicated issue that I'll leave to one side for now. But the fundamental idea would be this is not just somewhere where you know uh, this is left to one side. This is a this is a, a a burning issue for the party as a whole. And again, some of these controversies feed in then later on to her reception and distortion of her um, legacy. In the article and in the book, I highlight three schools. Of thought for this, I think there's probably three and a half to four, maybe. We'll, I'll, I'll throw a few ideas around in a second about that. Um, but in terms of her legacy and its distortion, Western historiography, particularly in the context of the, the Cold War uh, and a kind of avowed uh, anti, anti Marxism, um, the equation of Marxism with fatalism or uh, determinism or authoritarianism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that particularly hits second, as we'll see. Official communism, which has a particularly dark and unforgivable history, I'm going to say, particularly from the perspective of an archive rat, as I'll get into it, uh, some of the things that have happened are, are, are terrible. Uh, feminism, clearly, given the fact that Setkin is, you know, so uh, decidedly anti-feminist in her approach. Again, I have to package that word. I'll, I'll, I'll unfold that in a second and pack it in a second. Um, and then this kind of, in the 1970s, a, a confluence or a meeting or a, um, an overlapping, if you like, of the, the women's movement, the feminist movement and the left. So you have uh, Eurocommunism, Maoism, Trotskyism, right, which uh, I, I haven't developed as, as much as I would like, but I think that's something I would throw out there as well, to at least put some more uh, discussion on these questions. Beginning with the first school of thought, the Western historiography, I think it's best illustrated if we look at one of the, well, one of the products of the International Socialist uh, Women's Movement, which is still with us today, i.e. March 8th, International Women's Day, right? Um, which I know, I'm uh, responding to a letter in the paper, I know was not, you know, born of second wakes up one day and eating a cereal and says, oh, let's have an International Women's Day, hurrah, uh, you know, because I've, you know, <laughs> I've been reading this stuff for a while. Yes, the, the, the idea comes from America and Texas, I think in New York, uh, and there's, there's always been this idea that that should be celebrated in some way or commemorated in some way by the international workers' movement. The point is, though, that in order to organize such a demonstration or such an event, you need an organization, you need uh, parties that can put it on internationally. And that was Tekin's approach. That's, as, as I outlined, that's what she achieved and that's what she pressed for then in Copenhagen uh, for the, uh, the inauguration of International Women's Day. But now, uh, it's, you know, if, you, if you look, I, I mean, my, my perspective is mainly on Germany, but if you look at International Women's Day today, it's been completely torn from those walls, right? Um, I did hear one thing on Radio 4, which 
I hadn't had my breakfast, which is fortunate. Uh, that was this year about some Ukrainian uh, women. I can't remember whether they were quoting Clara second, but she came, her name came up, and I thought, she's, I, you know, this, the, the day's over and it's 10 past six. Uh, uh, you know, that was, uh, so it's, occasionally it's mentioned and you will see the thing, but the, the whole, even if second's name is mentioned, it's, it's mentioned in a highly kind of abstracted way from its roots in, uh, in, in revolutionary Marxism, so, you know, to, to, to make the point. And it kind of dovetails with this idea that, you know, women's rights, democracy, these are, these are kind of a package that come with the emergence of capital and rule of law and whatever, whatever. And I think that's a that's a, a kind of fitting way of seeing, you know, where this has ended up in the West. But it's got a it's got a particular history, particularly in the context of the Cold War in the 50s in Germany, uh, which I talk about briefly in, 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 in the book as well. Um, because in in Cold War Germany, for example, where there is People do have access on some level to some of Setkin's writings. I'll come back to that in a second. The fact that, that, that we don't have everything, but they do have access, and the there are groups such as the KPD, uh, which is banned in the in the early fifties, that will actually go out on or to, attempt to go out on, uh, on International Women's Day and say, you know, this is our day. This is the day of the, of the working women. International working women is part of our history, etc. But in official German discourse, this is seen as a kind of event of the devil, right? And uh, and the, the the reason for that in particular is Tetkin's uh, proximity to to Lenin, to the, the Soviet Union. Again, we'll come back to that, um, and all the rest of it. So the, uh, very much there's a there's a, a a sense in which in in the in the heated uh, atmosphere of the 1950s, it's really only the far left that even attempts to take up International Women's Day in, in Germany, and they say they're, they're swiftly banned for it. You had the Deutsche Kommunist Partei, the DKP, that came later, and they would they started to issue pamphlets um, of, of Setkin's writings and uh, others from uh, by Babel and, and Engels, for example, that essentially what they revolved around, again, in, in response to the particular context of the time, was the importance of, uh, of women's work and women working uh, and, and being organized in the workplace at a time when the kind of uh, the, the, the prevailing idea was that women should be kind of uh, condemned to you know eternal housewifery and all the rest of it. So there's a there's a there's a there's a, a, a kind of revival or a rekindling of interest of sorts, but it's marginal, and I would argue it's only kind of scratching the surface of Tekin's uh, uh, political and theoretical output, as we still are today, but that's, that's, we'll come back to that. Um, and in terms of the SPD itself, clearly then it's it shifted gear. Uh, you have the Gordesberg, Bad Gordesberg Congress in 59, where, you, you know, if it hadn't uh, been clear enough already, the SPD officially junks, uh, you know, it, it's passed in terms of uh, uh, Marxism altogether. And um, and then that has particular implications. I have found, I mean, this is a wonderful illustration of the SPD and how it operates even today. I did find stuff in uh, posters from the 90s, I think, um, of local, not, not the actual national SPD organization, but local SPD. And it's, uh, I've got a picture of it in the book. It says, uh, our contribution to, to uh, uh, International Women's Day, dot, dot. International Women's Day and a nice picture of Clara. Uh, so it kind of shows how the uh, the SPD operates. Uh, you know, I'm sure you know, the, 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 we all have anecdotes of that, but the SPD is a particular a particular monster um, mm -hmm. that, that we have to think about. Um, on the other side, then, we come to kind of the official communist section. I could talk for hours on this because it's uh, it's bizarre. It's it's really really odd, uh, as you know, as we would probably expect. Um, but there's there's a lot of history here. But I'd like to pick out a few moments, I suppose. Tekin <laughs> has a complicated let's put it this way has a complicated relationship with the Soviet Union, uh, to put it mildly. The, I would argue, and again, this is why in response to the comrade of the letter this week, I, I'm definitely not in the way of hero worship in Setkin. Right? So at, at some point, she speaks, uh, I don't know if this is the right, uh, French news accusant, you know, that it's a, it's a, 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 a derivant jacuzzi. Yeah, she speaks at a trial of uh, socialist revolutionaries where they will be condemned to death. 
right? Okay, you have to understand it in the context, et cetera, et cetera. This is attacks on Lenin, this is, you know, it's a difficult kind of things like that. Um, and, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, she will speak of uh, the, the, the importance of uh, the crack, cracking down on democracy. She will speak of uh, Zinoviev and Trotsky as uh, lunatics or criminals. You know, she's fully embedded within that factional environment, uh, that, that horrible factional environment uh, of, of the time. She went through those struggles. That's not to say, however, that she wasn't critical of what was going on. The tragic aspect of her relationship to events in the 30s in particular is the fact that with her ailing health uh, in particular, she's kind of, it's, it's possible for her to be pushed aside largely. So it's only in her correspondence, which we still don't have access to, by the way, completely, uh, that we see between the, not between the lines in a correspondence, we see her actual response to some of the uh, the the, uh, the the things that are happening in in the early thirties. Um, I've got a, a quote here from uh, uh, not, this is uh, uh, in response to Stalin's policies for the KPD, of which she was a leading member and, and parliamentarian uh, right up until the last days. Uh, she puts this is actually in a letter to Pietnitsky. She says, developments are catastrophic. The line imposed by, by the Stalin leadership on the KPD destroys everything that Marxist theory has taught us and what Lenin's practice has shown to be historically correct. She is also aware of the fact with ailing health and starting to maybe, maybe starting to lose it a little bit as well, but she's aware of the fact that her correspondence is being monitored. Right? However, her, precisely her status, her esteem, her acclaim in the international movement, I think, keeps her alive. She is a person who has such authority that fundamentally the regime cannot act against her as it did in, in, in other ways. Maybe it's also slightly a bit early, but I think there's, uh, you know, there, there is that, that aspect to it. She was generally supported, as I've made this, this point before, of, of, of the right. She was a fan of Bukhari. And his uh, and his uh, writings and his approach um, was absolutely intrinsically opposed to the uh, uh, the social fascist line, for example, which again you see in letters that she writes to Germany, uh, saying this is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and she was always kind of aware of the need to speak to, win, criticize, appeal to social and democratic voters, workers, etc. Indeed. Uh, some of her, uh, Margarita Wengers, who was a, another instrumental figure in the International Socialist uh, Women's Movement, was a parliamentarian for the SPD eventually in, in Weimar. They would often sit together, they were good friends, etc. And you know, they were highly critical of each other. But she always saw the need to speak to the masses still under the sway of social democratic uh, uh, politics, etc. So there's all sorts of stuff that, that, that can be can be seen, her, her criticism of it, of what was going on. Stalin, I, I mentioned this last year, Stalin referred to as the old witch, right? Uh, consciously or otherwise, uh, uh, reflecting the words of Kaiser Wilhelm der Zweite, who said, uh, called her the most dangerous witch of the, of the German empire. Um, and so, so there's, there's, there's complications right from the start, also when it comes to her writings. So in the latter days of her life, she's very ill. She's being looked after by her son, Maxime's uh, uh, second wife, Amelia Mulder-Dovina. Um, there is this complicated question in history whether Mulder-Dovina was actually working for the regime in that, at that point. I leave that open-ended because I've, I haven't done enough research on it. I don't want to make big claims that I can't uh, substantiate. But th there's also uh, uh, family feuds then about what exactly is going to be taken by the party archives in Moscow and, and all the rest of it. So it actually leads to a fallout between the two sons, one who stays in the GDR and is a highly respected doctor, uh, and the other who eventually ends up in, in the US and I think Canada. Uh, so there's, there's the whole question of what to do with the papers and her instrumentalization. Following on, on from what I said about her importance, and despite the uh, the hostility that existed between her and some of the leaders in uh, Stalin in particular, at her burial, you already see the process of instrumentalization, right? So it's Stalin and Molotov who are at the front. Again, I've got the picture in the book, the bearers of the coffin in front of the cameras, etc. 
um, you know, the hero of the Soviet Union, the, the Babushka Kommunisma, again, if I pronounce that incorrectly, I apologize, the, the grandmother uh, uh, of communism, etc. And there's very quick moves, not just in the Soviet Union, which I obviously know less about, but certainly within the GDR, uh, to instrumentalize her, her legacy for its own particular uh, uh, ends. <coughs> Second, Second's importance to the GDR to, to in, in, in the late 40s, early 50s is underscored by the fact that a whole series of official publications are issued by that, uh, by that state within the first years of its existence. Wilhelm Pieck, who you may, may know, uh, KPD leader and uh, eventual leader of the uh, GDR, was actually a very, very close friend of Tekkings. So there's personal connection there. I've read Pieck's uh, biography of, of Tekin in the early 50s and it is remarkable that even there you start to see <clears throat> the instrumentalization of the popular front of the uh, uh, of Tekin's uh, role against uh, fascism etc um, and so what the point I'm making is that for the GDR <clears throat> she was a, a, an a incredibly important figure on the banknotes in the you know it, 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 it instrumentalized uh, uh, and, and lionized but at what cost? And the, the, one of the, the flip side of that instrumentalization was the fact that Maxine, her, the son that stayed in the GDR, put together a 34 volume, 34 volume collection of her, it's called Reden und Schriften, speeches and, and writings. On top of which, and you know, I've, I've sat in Berlin and had these bloody things dumped onto tables, right? Uh, on top of which, uh, you know, the, uh, always under the stamp of streng geheim, strictly confidential, right? Uh, you then get the correspondence. So you see what she's writing to Piatnitsky, you see what she's writing to Trotsky, you see what she's writing to Zinoviev, you see what she's writing to Stalin. None of that was published in the GDR. Despite the fact that there were named, there were there were days named after her, there were schools named after, there were universities named after, there were conferences like this, week-long conferences of historians devoted to the life and work of Clara Tetkin. You had three volumes in in the, the, the emerge in the GDI. I've got them at home. They're called Ausgewählte Reden und Stiften, so selected uh, 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 speeches and writings, and you know. The, the most important word in that title is selected uh, because, let's say, there's three volumes of 34. There's very little by way of correspondence apart from some, some things where you know, she vindicates the, the Russian Revolution, the rest of it, um, you know, carefully chosen. But also, and as, as recent scholars such as Jörn Schuchum have shown, uh, the writings contained in them, because they're reprints and, 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 and made, are actually contain uh, huge distortions and, and words are simply changed. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I made the point, uh, uh, I think maybe maybe last year talking about 1917, where Tekin is incredibly, is, she's she's incredibly supportive of the, the, the politics of, of, of Bolshevism, Bolshevism in 1970, but she also has a, her doubts or concerns or open questions, etc. And she worries about what she calls uh, 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 Bruderkrieg, fraternal war, she calls it, between the left parties, right? So, Bolshe so are, are they going to fall out the left SRs, the Mensheviks, Bolshe It's kind of like a, it's expressed as an open question. What will happen here? Is this the right thing to do? I don't know. That is changed to Bürgerkrieg, which is civil war, right? And uh, completely removed the thing. So, you know, I, I haven't had the time and, you know, not on one level, nor the inclination to go through it. But you see, as I say, that the, the other side of the instrumentalization is the sheer distortion. And there is a film that was made in the GDR. Uh, I don't know if any of you've seen it. Um, and I, I, I was so excited when I looked it up. Thought, okay, this, how is this going to re represent her life? Um, you know, this is just fascinating. And basically, it's, a, it's an hour long devoted just to just one single episode, very important episode, as we said, in her life. When she says, as she'll put it, I'll be there dead or alive, because she is she is in her in her last days, when she travels from uh, just outside of Moscow and is kind of smuggled secretly in. Well, not secret, she, she's kind of they have to put, uh, produce kind of fake, fake routes for her because this is a time when Nazism is on the march and she's what there's been threats on her life, etc. She goes to Berlin to the Reichstag and gives a speech against fascism in a in in a packed fascist house. 
basically, right, as the oldest member of the German Reichstag, the Erdmannsfeder. You can listen to that online, by the way, today. You can see how uh, old and ailing she is, bless her. And she's really struggling. I mean, she's half blind as well, so she's trying to read the, the script. An incredibly powerful moment in history. But that was it. That was the film. You know? so, so again, it's this, it fits, it, it kind of overlaps with or feeds into uh, you know, the GDR self-narrative as the protected the, the wall against fascism, et cetera, et cetera. And that was something that was that was uh, accentuated at the cost of a real engagement with her with her life and times. And that clearly leads to sorry, Bob, sorry, sorry. Um, mm-hmm. that that clearly leads into um many of the problems that we have today on the left, which I'll which I'll discuss, because it is still the case that, you know, forget the English stuff for now, just go to the German stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, three volumes, I mean, they're quite large vol- volumes, but they're, you know, I say 34 volumes of work, 34 volumes of correspondence of 36 volumes. They're, they're more or less equal in, 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 in size, right? And uh, they've locked away uh, for, for so many years. Uh, and finally, now we're, we're getting access to them. So I've been working on. Uh, digit- producing a database of all of our art- articles, the Gleichheit, uh, which is German and English, so I can summarize the, the whole thing that's taking me a long time, <laughs> but I'm going to slowly uh, go through it. Marga Vogt has produced uh, the first volume of the war letters, or letters during the First World War, which I briefly discussed last year. And this uh, October, I think there will be the in German, the the Revolution, so the, 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 the letters about revolution. Uh, finally, after all this time, so it's it, you know there is a, there is a certain rekindling of of interest. I should talk really about the uh, having gone on from 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 that. Uh, I should talk about feminist reception of Tetkin, which begins. It doesn't begin in the seventies. There's evidence of it, particularly in Germany, of of, of reception before then, perhaps. Um, but certainly in in the seventies is when you uh, that, that you you get kind of more interest in in her work. Uh, and looking to her as a kind of point of reference to understand uh, what's going on with the new social movements, etc. And I should, from the outset, make clear that there, there's a problem with terminology here. And again, this might sound kind of like the archive rap thing, but I think it's very, it's highly significant in terms of the distortion of the legacy amongst feminism more broadly. Context is all important, and understanding the period in which she's writing, but also the language which she's using, and that's significant. The German term feminismus really does not come about. It, it takes off after the Second World War, and particularly you can you can you can trace these things uh, uh, online, but it actually emerges as a as an anti. Right, it's not, it's not in the sense of an uncle and auntie, but an anti feminismus uh, is a discourse of the right wing towards and during and towards the t- t- towards and during the First World War. So it's kind of terminology of the right, the anti feminist, yeah, uh, that are opposed to women's suffrage uh, and, and all of the things that, that, uh, that, that happened as a result of the November Revolution. But feminismus in the, in the context of the international socialist women's movement simply does not exist as a term. Let alone socialistisch feminismus, which is socialist feminism. The second never uses that term. It does not exist as a category in her time, right? Only in the 1920s does she talk about feminismus. And I've got a quote, I think I've put that in the paper as well, about how she describes uh, um, uh, 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 feminism in the 1920s, essentially saying that fem- the, the SPD's women's movement, because obviously she's now part of the communist women's movement, she's saying the SPD women's movement has become bourgeoisified. It differs from feminism uh, only in name, not in essence. They have the same politics, which fundamentally fudges the question of uh, uh, capitalism and, and workers' rule. So that, that you know, that, that's the, one of the few times you will see us speak of feminism, and that's in the context of the 1920s. The term that she uses, I don't know how many Germanists there are here, is uh, for for the the, the the bourgeois women's rightists is Frauenrechtlerei. And Lerai in German, it's very hard. It's a bit like the Kautsky. You know, last day has talked about Kautskyism. So you talk, and in Russian, you have Kautskyism as a kind of neutral term, and Kautskyism, Kautsky, what a bastardism type of thing, right? Uh, so, uh, and and it's, a, it's a little bit like that. It's hard to do in English unless you can play around with, 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 with words, uh, with, with, the, with the suffix. 
but you have a Frau, so a Frauenrechtlerin is a women is literally a women's writer, a female women's writer. Right, a Frauenrechtler would be a male women writer. Um, and the way you could probably describe this is, if you if, you know, a, a nice snappy translation would be somebody who sees the world only through the prism of uh, uh, women's rights uh, against uh, abstracted from society and, the, and other social relations. Right, a nice a snappy translation. <laughs> but as soon as you add the the Lurai suffix, it, it it's polemical. It's there to create distance. So a few more examples. So Frauen uh, Lurai is. <laughs> The, 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 there's a there's a lovely uh, uh, title of a, a Turkey article. So the, the the women's writers droning on about class, class harmony again, and that's two words in German, by the way. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, droning on about, but as soon as you add lullaby, it it adds distance. It's polemical. It's disparaging. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's it's there to to uh, create opposition. So uh, examples: uh, uh, Bernstein lullaby was what Luxembourg constantly referred to as what would be translated as Bernsteinism, but it doesn't do the point, it doesn't quite do justice to, because you know, Bernsteinism could also be a new, neutral term. So Bernstein Lurie or, you know, the, the, the nonsense of Bernstein. Kautsky, when talking about the uh, the general strikers, will talk of General Streichlerei. So those who see basically uh, the solution to all problems in in for the general strike. So that's the that's the, the package, that's the, the, the way in which it's packaged. Um, this notwithstanding, scholars, feminist scholars, not only feminist scholars, but, but more broadly, and people who read German describe this as feminism. And indeed, some of the, 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 the left, uh, uh, more left-wing feminists, Quartert and Herve in particular, say they kind of recognize the issue here, but then they say, oh, Clara Zetkin was a reluctant feminist. Why, they say? Well, because feminism actually apparently in the German Kaiserreich in the 1890s and 1900s means all efforts to ameliorate the position, the social position and political position of women. Does it, given the fact that, you know, second point is saying there are many ways to address this question, ours should be clear. So there's, there's a it mixed up with all this confusion is, is a basic linguistic uh, uh, problem. And it, uh, as I said before, it's, it's, a, it's a sense of one of the, the kind of cardinal sins of historical inquiry in a sense is then using the, the values and terminology of our time and projecting them back to a context in literally which they, in which they do not exist. Right? Socialistische Feminismus does not exist in, in Setkin's uh, uh, writing. The, one of the other uh, bone, many bones of contention between the feminists uh, and Setkin was on the question of organization. Um, so for example, until 1908, it was in most parts of Germany and Prussia, uh, it was illegal for women to organize politically, right? So often what would happen, there would have to be a pretext for a meeting for which, uh, under which women could get together and it would be stormed or uh, dissolved by a member of the police or someone would always be listening to what was said and they'd be talking about a, a strike movement or exam for example, and the police would say, no, that's political, <laughs> meeting disbanded or you're all arrested, right? Um, and there were ways in which the German party got around that through a system of uh, so trusted representatives. Uh, they changed the, the, the word for that, by the way, from the male to the female uh, in 1892, I believe, uh, to reflect the fact that women were acting as now as well as Vertrauenspersonen. And that they were kind of the networkers between these semi-legal or illegal uh, women's groups and organizations and the party leadership, right? So it's a very interesting uh, relationship there. And for many feminists, this is an example of uh, autonomous independent organization, uh, which then is crushed by uh, by the, the, the change in the law in 1908, the uh, Gazette's. Uh, which basically makes it po legally possible for women to join political parties. And what there's a discussion about that in the party, so what do we now do? And Setkin and others would say, well, look, we are uh, we're very much of the view, and Setkin represented this view also into the 1920s, that women should join the party organizations alongside men. That does not, however, uh, preclude the need for a specific targeted agitation or for magazines like Die Gleichheit for that matter, right? That doesn't get rid of that need, but women should in the first instance join uh, the party. And one uh, recent feminist book, book I read in German uh, called A Red Feminist, um, 
likened this approach by the party leadership to uh, basically the anti-socialist point. So clamping down on women's organization in the same way that the, the German Kaiserreich clamped down on the, on the SPD, uh, which is uh, uh, slightly overblown. That said, it was one of the interesting things about the German socialist women's movement is that the, the increasingly rightward drifting leadership was quite weary, quite conscious of the strength of the, uh, the women's movement in Germany, not least because to all intents and purposes, there was a split, but to all intents and purposes, it intend to shut down the, the annual women's congresses, we also have to see it through the prism of political consolidation, right? So clearly that was an example of bureaucratic overreach, but it wasn't <laughs> informed necessarily by the idea that there are oh, these women, we should stop them talking. It was the idea that, that they represent potentially a political uh, stronghold in the party, which they were trying, which they felt threatened by. Indeed, as I spoke about last year in the, about the First World War, um, one of the party directives in during the First World War uh, was to cancel all trade union and affiliated subscriptions to Carpetek and to Gleichheit. They tried, first of all, to run it dry, basically, and remove all funding uh, from it, but she kept it going uh, uh, despite that. Um, that's slightly over time. Uh, the, the, this is uh, so the. Maybe, maybe this is a good point for to start discussion as well. Um, but the uh, what's more of a problem in my view? So we've talked about official communism. Uh, you know, looking at the leftist discussion for a second. <coughs> One of the, um, the, the what's more of an issue, I think, is when the far left and far left writers and historians and, and whatever to the extent that they they exist these days. Um, kind of take the lead of people like Fatia and Herve in describing uh, Tekin as a socialist feminist. I think that's highly problematic. Now, you could say, you could have a debate there and say, well, okay, this, this was of its time, it's a different era now, whatever. That, that's, that's a discussion to be had, right? And I have a particular view on that. I, 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 don't, I don't think there, there, is, uh, there is reason to, to, to change that. But what I have a particular issue is, with is when it's just portrayed in these terms of, oh, she was a socialist feminist, because it reminds me actually quite a lot, albeit with the, without locking away the archives and everything, it reminds me actually of the kind of Stalinist, monumentalist view of Tetkin, which is, okay, she said this, but we can just kind of ignore it because actually she meant this, right? And a, a good example of that is uh, Die Linke. Die Linke has a, um, an annual Clara Tetkin prize, uh, and so a Clara Zetkin uh, um, award. Uh, I won't win it for two reasons. Uh, can anyone guess why? <laughs> well, yeah, good start. Let's <laughs> say three then. <laughs> Sorry? Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, because I'm not a woman, right? And uh, and obviously because I'm quite critical as a pro. But the opening speech of this pride, you know, which is generally a, a good thing, said, isn't this wonderful? This is our feminist contribution to d -Linker. Okay, and again, fine. But what about Setkin herself? You don't, you don't have a right to reply when you're dead. That's the issue, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this, it's, this, this, this kind of instrumentalization that is really, and it, it said, for me, it, it's reminiscent of the, the kind of older uh, uh, Spanish approach. So yeah, socialist feminism, I quote uh, Vladimir Fakin on this, who basically wrote to me and said, I'm doing a piece on Tekin, can you give me some material? I said, yeah, here we go. And um, again, the granddad of socialist feminism, uh, a legendary socialist feminist. And, you know, as I say, it's just the, the, uh, the this kind of the left tailing or being absorbed by other other movements. And as I say, I've talked about uh, Maoism, Trotsky, and clearly as well in, in amongst the Euro communists, that was a big discussion. Uh, and I haven't gone into that in the in, in the book or whatever, but it can be seen in my in my opinion, at least anyway, it reflects a a, a left that is increasingly unaware of its own history, of its own concepts, of its own development, and where these ideas uh, come from. Um, and I think that's probably a good place to to stop in the sense that you know what I am trying to do with my project um, is is really you know as with as with other things I do historically is to really get across. Kind of second in her own words, what she actually said, what she, you know, that the placing in context, what she said, what was she trying to achieve with that, etc. 
And in that sense, yes, a critical rediscovery. But I'm not here to place Tsepkin on a pedestal. I think she was an, you know, a remarkable historical figure. And I think that the left's response or, or engagement with her, with her legacy actually does not do justice to that, to, to, to her brilliance, because it doesn't treat her uh, uh, critically in, in, in a thinking Marxist way. And I think once you start to, um, when, you know, once we get access to more of the material, once we think about these questions in their context, uh, critically, contextually, uh, then you, we actually begin to discover not only what was flawed and limited, and I've made some points about that, but precisely uh, what was uh, 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 brilliant uh, and enduring in, in her writing. So, you know, uh, not, uh, hey, geography, but uh, historical. Thank you.